Hello, hello. Oh, thank you, thank you, um, Omar. I can. I wanted to know if you guys can hear me. I think I have a problem with my camera, and uh, I think we can go ahead and start. This is gonna be a very interactive. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. We're gonna share knowledge. We're gonna share some good stuff. Uh, you know very well today. I'm I'm doing a neurology presentation. I'm a psych resident. I'm doing my rotation in neurology. And you know, um, obviously, uh, this is COVID pandemic, COVID nineteen pandemic, and uh, we want to share the knowledge and make medical education continue going wherever you are. Uh, so, guys. Um, just one second. I want to share this PowerPoint. Uh, if somebody can send me a message, tell me if you can see my PowerPoint uh, so that we go from there, I'll be very happy. Um, so, anybody? Okay, let me see. Awesome. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Victor. Sheila, thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, thank you, Paul. Welcome, 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 guys. I'm so excited today to do this, guys, and um, I feel like this can help you. I'm, I'm not going to teach everything in neurology in one hour, to be honest, and it's not like I'm teaching. This is more of an interactive session where we kind of get to know each other and, you know, encourage each other to continue studying and doing this, you know. So, um, I want to let you know that we have a couple of things that are scheduled for you. And um, next week, Dr. Judy Gishoya, who actually is my was supposed to be my co-host, she told me that somebody else is gonna come on board. I think uh, is another interventional radiologist. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to meet her. You know, we have radiologists around, so we're gonna start have, giving them some classes. We'll start with neuroanatomy. So she will teach some how you can recognize um, subdural hemorrhages or epidural hemorrhages, whatever kind of hemorrhage that you might think of. Anatomy of how the blood supply goes to different places. And she will take care of that section. Then Dr. Madenge will, she is a radio um, ophthalmologist and a resident PGY3 currently. So she will teach you tracts. I, we, we're trying to divide this um, kind of neurology thing or any other kind of learning and bring many experts on board. Actually, we're looking to have a very packed Saturdays coming um, subsequent months. And we have Dr. Joe Mogir also coming in with cardiology. He's interested in cardiology. So he will start with ECGs and do a couple of other things, you know. Um, so with that being said, that means we're thinking of you guys and you welcome today. I know some of you are not able to see me. It's okay. <clears throat> the most important thing is the information that we're, talking, we're going to talk about today. So I will highly encourage you to use the chat. And let me know what's going on, if you are able to see me, if you are able, if there is any question. So my objectives today basically is to go ahead and have a minor kind of slow mode revision of embryology. Uh, I like um, the biggest thing I think for me in neurology is being able to localize lesions. So I will really do a lot of work on that. And um, I may not talk about the spinal cord for today because of time but we will see how that goes. With cranial nerve impairments, they will be associated with the localization actually. I, may, I don't have much on muscle disorders, but I have something on headaches if time allows us to get there. So guys, I have a quick question for you and I would like you to answer it. My poll starts now. Um, if you can see the poll, please let me know. Basically, this is, which one of the following is a derivative of the telencephalon? Um, I would like you guys as much as possible, whether you know or you don't know. So we're just revising the embryology, how the, the brain basically develops. I, I, 
I encourage you not to look at what people post because most of the time these questions they might look they might look easy, but I'm telling you, um, they might not be as easy as you might think. So, which one of the following is a derivative of the telencephalon? Let's go. You have 10 more seconds. I encourage everyone, I have only seven people here and I have 32 people on board, 38 actually. So guys, everybody, please just throw in something. I'm gonna give you 10 more seconds because we don't have uh, many people answering this. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll right there. So I don't know if you can see the poll results. Victor, are you able to see the poll results? Anybody? No, perfect. So I have the results, that's good. So that you guys don't um, go with the, the routine of others. So we have 35% choose A, which um, we'll see whether it's correct or not. Uh, for twenty percent of you chose C, ten percent D, and E, thirty-five percent of you chose the basal ganglia, and that seems to be the right answer. So let's look at E as the right answer. So thirty-five percent got it correct. So basically, I will tell you how to remember these things. If you can see, let me close this because. Um, if you can look at that embryology, I pulled this from uh, we, uh, online. Uh, it's not my document, this one. I just pulled it for learning purposes. So the telencephalon and the diencephalon are part of the forebrain, these two. So the optic vesicle, I know some of you talked about the retina. It tends to be associated with the diencephalon, okay? So mesencephalon is the midbrain. I always say that mesencephalon is a messenger, M-E-S-E. -E. So it's, it's getting message from the forebrain and sending it to the, the, the hindbrain. So that's why I call it messenger, mesencephalon. It's in between the, the two, the, 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 in between the two, the forebrain and hindbrain. So, and then this one is divided into metencephalon and myelencephalon. Perfect. So if you look at it again on this, um, picture, we have a telencephalon uh, giving the lateral ventricles. We have the third ventricle associated with um, parts of the diencephalon. We have uh, the future cerebral aqueduct associated with the, the midbrain mesencephalon, okay? I like this midbrain because it always reminds me where I can demarcate. The optic vesicle. So remember, diencephalon. Okay, so so this picture is in your first aid. I don't know, page 490 something or something like that. If you have a, uh, the, uh, it's first aid 2020 edition. Um, it's, uh, this is what they say. The cerebral hemisphere, where you get the telangephalon, at the base is a basal ganglia, somewhere here. So I usually say the base of the telangephalon is a basal ganglia. So it's part of it. It's part of the telencephalon. If you look at your first aid, it will show you its cerebral hemisphere and the basal ganglia. So that's part of it. The, the diencephalon, I tend to remember the diencephalon with the TH, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the third ventricle. And I believe the subthalamus should be part of this, the diencephalon. So this makes life so easy. Um, if you remember, my answers, if I was doing this question, the thalamus, hypothalamus, all these, I know they belong somewhere. This belongs to at least the, the, the midbrain somewhere there. So my, I was to be confused between the retina and basal ganglia, but as I've shown you that the diencephalon is associated with the retina. So this, the retina also comes in here. That's maybe confusing. There's no better way of knowing it, but I look at this and I tend to associate it with the retina. Like, yeah, I don't know if that's correct, but that's how I remember it. I don't, wanna, I don't want to go lower than that. 
uh, the midbrain cerebral aqueduct, I don't want to go lower than that because you tend to confuse. I like concentrating on specific areas that will help me like eliminate in a multiple choice question. So another question right here, guys, this will be 40 seconds. So first of all, I'll go read, which of the following sign is usually associated with a lesion at the cerebellum? Okay, let me go ahead and put this poll out there. If you can see my poll, you have 40 seconds. Please, everyone, do this. I don't know who is polling for what. So go ahead and answer my questions. Please, guys. You have 30 seconds. No, not 30 seconds. You have like 20 seconds, sorry. 60% of you have voted. I appreciate that. 70%, I think when I'm at 70%, that's good for me. So I'm gonna stop the poll. This is a very, very tricky question. It's not very tricky anyway. But most of you chose B, nystagmus. Nystagmus is not, is not part of the cerebellum. Scanning speech, that's answer A, tends to be correct. So 24% of you got it right. I don't want to discourage you. I put these questions intentionally to make you feel the, how you should study. So I'm going to localize these lesions so that you know why we're talking about scanning speech. Let me rem remind you, scanning speech is not equal to um, aphasia. Aphasia and aphasic disorders, those can be in the cortex somewhere where we look at it today. But scanning speech is like a toxic kind of speech. That's how I call it. If you see a baby trying to look for words to say when they are growing and learning to learn, that's kind of scanning speech. And it's associated with the cerebellum. Nystagmus is associated with the midbrain. We will look, we localize this and we look at how the midbrain, the superior, um, the superior colliculis, where they are and how they kind of control these movements of the eyes. Hemibalismus, for sure, some of you answered, said hemibalismus. Hemibalismus should be in the subthalamic nucleus. Anytime I see hemibalismus, I think of the subthalamic nucleus. Aphasia is at the cortex somewhere, not in the cerebellum. Okay. Thank you guys for answering. I really appreciate you. And you can put a comment somewhere if you have any. So cerebellum. Tremor, intentional tremors, dysdiodokinesia, whereby you, I, I guess most of you know what dysdiodokinesia is, whereby you tell the patient to alternate movements of the hands on the other hand, or even on the leg, they can put, they alternate, you, you do it both sides for you to evaluate the cerebellum, because it can be one side of the cerebellum, either left or right. Ataxic gait, scanning speech, I told you, it's like ataxia kind of speech, like you're not balancing your words very well. So remember that for cerebellum. Basal ganglia signs. So movement disorders, whenever I talk about the basal ganglia, as I said, if you remember, the basal ganglia is at the base of the telencephalon. And that means if it's part of the telencephalon. And this is where we try, if, if you remember last week or the other week, I talked about deep brain stimulation. So we go slightly, below the telencephalon, just at, the, at the, um, the base of the telencephalon, and that's where we get the basal ganglia, and that's where we stimulate using deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. Athetosis, chorea, and hemibalismus. So basically, chorea and the kind of athetosis, these are things you see in Huntington, and they are associated with the basal ganglia. Postural instability, of course, if you remember, Parkinson's disease, how they walk and all that, they are very unstable sometimes and they can have falls. So rigidity, cogwheel rigidity, for example, for Parkinson's disease, you need to remember that cogwheel rigidity. Brainstem. So the brainstem is a derivative of the hind brain. You remember the brainstem has the pons, the uh, medulla, and also the midbrain. So um, this is where we kind of control most of the eye movements. Remember, there's another very important thing that you need to know. 
always in the exams, the medial longitudinal fasciculi lesions. They are very associated with this, the brainstem. The bulbar palsy means, basically, if I say bulbar palsy, it's usually part of the um, cranial nerves that have uh, some craniopathies, and usually the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th cranial nerves. So um, I will go back to these lesions, and we're going to localize them, all of them. Hopefully, I will not have a lot of time. So the other way of thinking about these lesions is by looking at the dominant and the non-dominant spheres of the brain. <clears throat> so ladies and gentlemen, doctors out there, this is very important for you. For example, the dominant side, if I'm left-handed, my, my dominant side should be on the right. Personally, I'm right-handed and most of the people out there are right-handed and that means our dominant side is on the left. So um, on the left side, we control speech. We control how we write, how we, you know, how we think about the left and right side. So you can have a physic, I don't know, my slide is not, it should show more, more than this. Because uh, I had three kind of columns and uh, four. Anyway, I, I think I remember what I, I have on the other slides. Because I, I can't see it like well. Let me try stop sharing like in PowerPoint. Let me see. I hope you can still see my slide. <clears throat> and this is what I wanted to show you. I think I made it so long than the way it should be. So the dominant side, you have aphasia, you have Gretzmann syndrome will come because of a lesion on the dominant side, usually at the temporal and part of the parietal, I believe. Um, so you have somebody who cannot calculate, they cannot, um, they cannot write, that's a graphia. Finger agnosia means like they cannot differentiate different fingers. You ask them which one is the ring finger and they cannot tell you. So the left-right confusion, that's another thing you can expect, like they cannot tell you that. There's another very important, very examinable thing called alexia without a graphia. So what does that mean? Alexia without agraphia means that you cannot, if you look at written, written language or written words, you are not able to interpret them. They don't make sense to you. But agraphia is your ability to write. So this person can write. You can tell them, go ahead and write this and this. But if they look at the writings, they are not able to make sense out of it. I don't know if that makes sense. So that's the dominant side. Um, looking at the non-dominant side, usually the non-dominant side, it doesn't care. It's like, I don't have, I don't keep attention. I, I neglect myself. That's my non-dominant. It, it doesn't care. It, it's like, I don't want, uh, I have a lesion there. I don't care about anything else. Hemi neglect. They neglect themselves. And also gnosia means that a patient comes to you to the clinic and they say, um, you know, they, they come to the clinic and they have left-sided weakness, for example. You tell them, why did you come in? It's like, I don't know. My family brought me here. Then you tell them, you know, do you realize that you have left, left leg weakness? They're like, hmm, okay, all right. So, you know, they don't care. That's kind of non-dominant lesions. That's how they present. Construction apraxia is basically you tell these people to go ahead and construct something. Maybe you give them a matchstick and they cannot do it very well. So the other things you should know, whenever you want to answer questions of dominant and non-dominant side, because you will see MCQs asking you that, just remember, the either hemisphere can present with hemiparesis. So if you see hemiparesis, it won't help you. Hemisensory loss, it can present from any side. Homonymous hemianopia. I, I think Dr. Wanja will talk more about hem homonymous hemianopia and how you can identify those lesions. Uh, focus seizures dementia. All those dementia is something we deal with in psychiatry. Uh, even seizures, it's more of neurology, but they can happen in e either lobe. Perfect. So guys, let's go to, I'm going to go back to my this kind of presentation so that yeah so guys type if you know uh this blue oh there's an answer there this is what i want us to look at actually 
I talked about alexia without agraphia, without agraphia, and this is usually the lesion. The reason is, remember the visual, sorry. Remember the visual center, it's right there, okay? So if the PCA, that is the posterior cerebellar artery, cerebellar, remember, this is part of the cerebrum. If you have a lesion, it will affect this area. So you cannot see your vision, like you, you, you're sensing the written words, they don't make meaning to you because you cannot integrate them. So the other way of explaining this is that um, a syndrome of uh, pure alexia is left posterior cerebral artery occlusion of right-handed individual. So if somebody is right-handed, the left side is the dominant side. So the left posterior cerebral artery needs to be occluded for you to have this. All visual information enters through the right hemisphere. So that's just more explanation on that. And right visual cortex perceives the written material but cannot transmit it to the left hemisphere because of the closure lesions. I, there's another way I'm gonna explain these lesions. And I'm choosing few of them so that I don't confuse you for the purposes of the one hour. <laughs> the other way of thinking about lesions is one, by their gait. If somebody tells you a gate, you want to localize lesions that way. If they tell you somebody's a toxic, that's cerebellar. A praxic, NPH, you remember the wet, wacky, and wobbly? Um, so these NPH patients come in with uh, dementia, so they, they're not thinking well, they have urine incontinence, and they have this apraxic gait. So that, that one should tell you exactly what you kind of anticipate. Fastening is associated with Parkinson's. If we don't talk about the gait, we talk about the tone, they have core wheel kind of rigidity, that's pa Parkinson's. Hemiparetic strokes. Um, also, if you're diplegic, you want to think about congenital anomalies. And stepage, you know, uh, you affect the nerves, and this will be Tebs dorsalis in tertiary syphilis. So guys, medulla pons and midbrain signs. How do you know that this is a sign of the medulla pons midbrain or part of the midbrain? You remember you guys, some of, I think majority of you talked about nystagmus as part of the cerebellum, which was wrong. Let me not say wrong because that's kind of harsh. Let me say which is not appropriate answer. Let's see how you can localize lesions. I want you to type, NPH stands for, um, normal pressure hydrocephalus, if, if I'm not wrong. Somebody else can always type in, you know, you can always answer each other, that's okay. We have like 50 people in joining us today. Yes, exactly 50. So let's look at the, this lesion. Can you type in, tell me, where do you think we are in? Quick, quick please. Which, which picture, this picture represents what part of the midbrain? Anybody? I think um, I answered it when I was asking or something like that. Somebody says basal ganglia, midbrain, upper, uh, pons. Okay, keep going. One more, one more answer. Any different upper midbrain? Perfect. So, so guys, you see, you have a lot of variances. So this is the midbrain. And these are, there's some way you wanna find out. You remember, I said the mesencephalon is kind of a, a passage. Uh, it's, it sends message from the upper part coming down. But I want you to look at this center. This is the cerebral aqueduct. I like Nathan. Nathan said superior colliculi. This one, superior colliculi, very much associated with your vision, the way you move your eyes. I want you to remember also that uh, this this here is the third cranial nerve, okay? It looks like Gardia, Gardia, Gardia the, how do we call it, the, the parasite or something like that. So this is the third cranial nerve. Actually, next to the third cranial nerve, but it's not in this picture right here, you will get the MLF, the medial longitudinal fasciculi. So remember, guys, remember, the superior colliculi, the third cranial nerve, you remember the third cranial nerve innervates most of the extraocular muscles, okay? 
So I, I'm trying to connect how these things go. This is the third cranial nerve. MLF tends to connect the third cranial nerve and the sixth cranial nerve. We will talk about that later. I want you to forget about that information for a second. Oh, you guys can't see the pointer? Are you able to see the pointer? Okay. Okay. Lydia has a problem. Okay, perfect. So forget about that MLF and vision, how your eyes move and stuff like that. I want you to concentrate on how to identify the midbrain. So there are a few things that really help me. You remember we said at the base, the basal ganglia is at the base of the telencephalon. So the basal ganglia has other structures around them. And the basal ganglia is associated with Parkinson's. So this, this you see right there, it's bilateral. Let me use this picture, perfect. So this one is the substantia nigra, this one. Remember the substantia nigra is associated with um, Parkinson's and we're talking about the basal ganglia, okay? But because the midbrain is very adjacent, so you can see some part of the substantia nigra in the upper part of the midbrain, okay? So the other things you see in the midbrain are these big balls, looking like eyeballs or something. Uh, these are the red nucleus, and we'll talk about them if we get some, a chance to do that. So basically, if you see all this, all this is the, the pedangles coming from up. You see the cortical spinal, the cortical bulba. So a recap, how do you identify the midbrain and you don't, you don't want to confuse it with any other part? The examiner will set, put you a picture there and they'll give you choices, confuse you. You don't know where you are, you in the pawns where you are. This, the, the cranial nerves, if you remember the midbrain, the cranial nerves, the cerebral aqueduct, this one. Is, the third cranial nerve, the cerebral aqueduct, the rubro, uh, the red nucleus, I think they are associated with rubrospinal, if I remember well. The substantia nigra, part of it, you see it down in the midbrain, okay? Perfect. The reason why I had this picture is because of the MLF. This picture is not very clear, but I want you to concentrate on this. So this is the third cranial nerve, and this is the MLF. So we have the MLF, the third cranial nerve, we have the superior colliculi, all this tends to coordinate your vision, how you move your vision, okay? So um, with that being said, where do you think we are right now? What is that for? Please, in few seconds, can you chat for me? Let me see what you guys have to say about that. Can you, can you type in in the chat? Somebody thinks it's the medulla, somebody thinks it's the pawns. Um, who else? Medalla, upper medalla. Perfect. So thank you guys. So this is the medalla. And the reason why, if you see this looking like a butterfly or something, this one is the inferior olivary nucleus. This is one thing you need to see. Yes, and the fourth ventricle. Okay, it's right there. So if you see that, that definitely you in the medalla. And there's another one more thing. What is this? This is the pyramids. Guys, this is the pyramids. So before they decassate, they decassate somewhere in the medulla down there. These are the pyramids. You need to see that picture and connect with the olivary nucleus and that should be almost given. There are some nice nucleus here that I would like us to know about. Let me just move to the next slide. So ladies and gentlemen, doctors, the olivary nucleus will always tell you you in the medulla. In the middle, you have the medial meniscus and the pyramids at the sides. I want you to concentrate on some few things here. You see this space? Let's look at it this way, using this, <clears throat> this side of the, of the picture. The cranial nerve 10, they tend to be there. Uh, the nucleus ambiguous usually connects cranial nerve 10. The lateral spinothalamic tracts. Remember, spinothalamic tracts takes care of your temperature, okay? And at this point, they have crossed, you know, 
uh, they have crossed to the, the other side. Whether they are coming from the left, they have crossed over to the right. And remember the hypoglossal nucleus, it's in the middle, okay? So there's a rule I want to bring up to you guys. I don't know why I put that picture, it's not clear. But in the exam, they will bring you some staining kind of uh, pictures. And even if you are in this kind of a very bad picture, which examiners will always give you, but you can see these inferior, inferior colliculi these ones and these are the pyramids so those nucleus you are talking about the vagus nerve the hypoglossal nerve should be somewhere there you really don't have to be a magician especially when you're studying for step one to know everything but you need to know some few things that can help you pass the exam so <clears throat> i know i have the ans answer here this is the pawns so remember remember this way the midbrain is next to the of, of course forebrain then when you come down, you have the pons in between the midbrain and the medulla. The reason why I don't put them in order is because I believe you can identify them by just looking at the picture. So the pons tends to have the sixth cranial nerve. That's very important. Remember, the facial nerve will curve around that nuclei and come out, okay? So uh, <clears throat> the other thing you need to remember is that there's, there's some, some dots looks dirty like, like that. For me, it looks like, um, I, don't, I don't remember this uh, lesion exactly, but it looks like there's some fibers there, like they're in a certain bundle running through here. And that tends to be another thing that helps me to think about pontine. And in fact, if you don't know this is pontine and you know you are medulla, you know the olivary nuclei doesn't, it's not there. And you know that you don't have the third cranial nerve, it's not there because third cranial nerve is the midbrain. So obviously, the other thing you might think of is that this might be the pons. That's the way you eliminate them. Actually, the best way to identify the pons is by eliminating the medulla and also eliminating the midbrain. And that's how you get it. I will tell you some rules that you might need to know. The rules are always surface. This, again, you see those fibers in red or maybe this side in black? They are the same fibers that we were talking about in the pons, the pontine fibers. Okay, so I'll tell you, it can, be, it, it can be any picture. It can look like the way they want to bring it on. But guys, I know we're ready for this. We can always, always identify where we are in the brainstem. So ladies and gentlemen, this picture is not clear. But you know what? That's why I'm here for you. I want, to, I want, I want you to put some concentration. There's a rule I was told by Professor... El Badawi, who taught me anatomy in Moy University. I think most of you maybe know him. So he told me there's a rule of, of uh, cranial nerves. It kind of looks like football, but it's a little bit different because we have 12 cranial nerves. So the rule is two is to two is to four is to four. So two, two, four, four. So remember, the first cranial nerve is... Um, the olfactory. Olfactory comes from the nasal area, goes to the cribriform, cribriform plate and ends there. The optic nerves, which you see them up here, they kind of come from the eyes and end up at the optic chiasma right there. The picture is not clear, I'm sorry. I tried to make them bigger, but it ends right there. So if you look at this picture, uh, the midbrain will only have Kind of, um, just one second, the, the oculomotor and part of the optic, okay? That's the midbrain. Sorry, actually, the, the, the optic does not come even to the midbrain. So you have the oculomotor and there's something you don't see here. The tro trochlear nerve, which is the fourth cranial nerve, should come from posterior. So it should come from the posterior end and then be seen like by the, by the side. So, and we, can't, we cannot see, and this picture is, is the worst. So the cranial nerve three and four. So the first two, optic and olfactory, you may not see them in the midbrain. They are before the midbrain or above the midbrain. Then in the midbrain, you have the oculomotor and the 
the trochlea. Remember the trochlea is more lateral, the oculomotor is medial. So I want you to remember the rule at the same time, remember oculomotor is in the middle. In the pontine area, you get the trigeminal. So there are four nerves here. So we, are, we say the two, two above the midbrain, two in the midbrain, and now we have four in the pons. So this is the trigeminal, this is the sixth cranial nerve, this should be the seventh, and I believe this should be the eighth. I think the seventh has like two parts of it. I can't remember very well, but remember this sixth, seventh, and eighth. So there's something again striking here. The ocular motor was medial, again the abducens is medial. You see that? There's let me finish the, the rule first, then I'll tell you the, the other things. The rule is not always perfect. So after you're done with the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth cranial nerve in the pons, the rest will be in the medulla. Okay, the ninth cranial nerve, the tenth cranial nerve, and all the others. You guys, I think you, I believe you remember this very well. So the rule is not always true. This is kind of a surface rule, but if you look, for example, the trigeminal, it will have some, it has like three nucleus. It has a spinal trigeminal nuclei. So it comes all the way down that nuclear. And also, and I can show you in this picture, the trigeminal. So the trigeminal will traf the nuclei will traverse uh, the medulla. And also will go even up to some parts of the midbrain, you see. So unless you have a lesion on the surface, but if you have a lesion in the medulla, you can see some symptoms of the trigeminal nerve. And that's very important to be honest. So this picture here is another way of explaining about um, the trigeminal nerve. So this looks like the main nuclei. This looks like the spinal nuclei. I don't remember how this nuclei, um, I don't remember. There's another name of that nuclei that goes all the way up. So guys, um, I don't want you to concentrate on anything else, but I want you to remember the spinal uh, trigeminal nuclear that goes to the medulla. So how will this rule actually help you to identify lesions? If you have a lesion, I will ask you some one question. And this, this question, I need you guys to go ahead and answer it. I like uh, active participation. So that's why I'm always doing these polls. <laughs> okay, guys. So I have a poll there. And a 60 year old has, a uh, year old female has sudden inability to abduct the right eye with right upper and lower facial para paresis. So has paresis of the face. He also has hemiparesis of the left arm and leg. What do you think is the lesion? Where is it located? So there's inability to abduct the right eye. And there's lower facial paresis. Where do you think the lesion is? I'll give you a few more seconds. We have 27% answering the question. So I like, we have everybody on board. Just think about it. You're not able to abduct. So which cranial nerve do you think is compromised? You can chat in the chat. We wanna help everybody through this as we, so somebody said the abducens. Paul. I believe, I believe in what you said. I believe this should be, that should be correct. So if it's the abducens, where is the abducens located? Brand said oculomotor. Perfect. So um, if you are not able to abduct the eye, I believe that should be the um, 
the, the sixth cranial nerve. And therefore, if it's the sixth cranial nerve, it's found in the pons. So is it medial or lateral? Sheila, thanks. Yes, the lateral rectus. I usually call it LR, LR6, lateral rectus six, sixth cranial nerve. So I'm, I'm gonna end the poll because 45% of you said it's E and I think that should be correct. Um, so, so guys, this tends to be easy and tends to be difficult at the same time. Remember, if you look at this picture in the pawns, let me just go up. Remember this. This is the sixth cranial nerve, very closely associated with the facial nerve. Remember the facial nerve sends motor to your face, motor to your face. What does that mean? Sometimes if you have a lesion at the sixth cranial nerve, most likely you might have another lesion with the facial nerve, okay? They are closely related. Is it medial or lateral? It must be medial because the abducens nerve is always medial. So that's how you know whether it's lateral or medial, okay? So um, because of those nerves, lateral rectus, ocular motor, you guys are not sure. I'm gonna have something on that, I believe. So I think this is the question we just did. I have one more question there for you guys. Okay, let's go. I really appreciate the participation and I believe you know, the USMLE exams or any other exam you're planning to do, it's full of questions. So you have to answer questions. So let's see. 45 year old Asian man presents with a right torsis. Right torsis, underline that. And a dilated, non reactive right pupil with external deviation of the right eye. He also has left hemiparesis with left sided Babinski. Can you localize the lesion? The patient has no speech abnormalities at this point. So where do you think the lesion is, guys? I have 13% answering the question and um, I need more people. I honestly do. I'm here for you my colleagues, doctors. Let me keep quiet, I think I'm confusing some of you. Okay. Can I get f at least 50% answer the question? We at 43%. Okay, perfect. Guys, this, thank you. Um, I'm gonna stop the poll. And 61% of you chose B. And I believe you might be right. I think this that's the best answer. Let me say the best, I don't wanna say correct. I'm trying to avoid those, correct or wrong. That is the best answer for me at this point. The reason is, if you can explain tosis, it's associated with what? It, can, it cannot be associated with the cerebellum. Tosis, basically, why do you get tosis? It's because of the oculomotor nerve, right? Cranial nerve three, thank you, Victor. So cranial nerve three is the reason why you get tosis. I can blab and say all the other things that I want to say in that uh, sentence, and um, they will not you know, they will not make a lot of sense. Remember, you can get hemiparesis anywhere. So I told you initially that it can be on the dominant, non-dominant. It can be also even within the brainstem because, you know, those tracts, as I told you, the midbrain is a messenger and all those tracts that are descending go through there, most of them. So, um, so the answer is the midbrain. So remember, and if you want to ask more, is it the... Um, let me just leave that one go. So it's the midbrain, the ocular, the ocular motor nerve is the big thing there that we have. And whenever they say the external deviation of the right eye, so that means like the, the, the cranial nerve, 
3 is weaker. That's why you have the deviation to the other side. Okay. So guys, next. I, by the way, thank you so much. All of you, congratulations. Most of you got this right. So I'm impressed with that. I think this is the highest score so far. So the next question is, a 60-year-old female presents to your office with signs of acute stroke associated with nausea and vomiting with vertigo. Noted nystigmas. So the patient has nystigmas and slowed speech. Not aphasia. Heads up. Slowed speech with difficulty swallowing saliva. She has loss of pain and temperature in the left side of her face and loss of pain and temperature on her I think that should be the contralateral side of the body, okay? On the right, let me say the right side of the body, okay? I think there was a typing problem. The patient has positive dysdeodokinesia on the left side. Can you localize this lesion? Guys, I'll keep quiet and I'm gonna put the poll so that I don't confuse you. If you need to, re to read the question again. Forty percent answered the question. I like to have more. Guys, um, I'm I'm getting forty eight percent answer the question. Can I have more? I like sixty percent. Will be amazing. Okay. This looks good, really good. I appreciate you guys and um, doctors, colleagues. Thank you for answering this question. This is one of the questions that I always get wrong until I started, um, you know, trying to teach and it has helped me to really localize these lesions, me too. <laughs> I'm not that good anyway. <laughs> so, um, 57% of you chose A. Let's find out. Let's find out if that's the best choice for this question. So guys, let's start this question. Acute stroke, fine. Acute stroke. So where is it? Nausea, vomiting, and vertigo. Which cranial nerve are you thinking about? Vomiting and vertigo. Give me the cranial nerve, please, on the chart. Cranial nerve 8. Thank you, Sheila. Nystagmus, where do you think is associated with this? Nystagmus. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, slowed speech, it's kind of dysarthria. What do you think is going on with slowed speech? Which cranial now? So dysarthria basically, yes. So you're thinking about the vocal cords, okay? So this tends to be cranial nerve 10, um, depending, and swallowing actually. So you're thinking about the pharynx and all that. And the innovation around that area is, if you confuse, the ninth and 10th cranial nerve always will be part, like they will be su supplying the pharynx, the vocal cords and all that area. So, we have the, kind of we have the eighth, the ninth, 
10th cranial nerve. Okay, let's go and see. She has loss of pain and temperature in the left side of her face. What supplies sensory uh, to the face? Which cranial nerve is that? Cranial nerve five, trigeminal. Guys, you are amazing. So, um, and loss of pain and temperature on her side of the body. So, what, what will make you lose pain and temperature on the right side, on the contralateral side, which is the right side? Spinothalamic. You guys are amazing. Okay. So, um, I, wanna, I want to try go back. I don't think we have a lot of time, but anyway. So you remember the spinothalamic, the spinothalamic, the spino, not thalamic, sorry, the spinotrigeminal will come all the way to the medulla. So a lesion in the medulla can give you facial loss of pain and temperature to the face, okay? Because of the spinotrigeminal. Okay, if you remember the other picture I was showing in the medulla, oh my God. This is now where I feel like I should have had good pictures, but that's okay. So, um, are we in the, th in the medulla? Yes. So this is the lesion actually I'm talking about, the Wallenberg syndrome, okay? This lesion here. So the, the, hypogloss, the, the hypoglossal is more medial. So if we have anything hypoglossal, we'll think about uh, lesions in the middle. And with that, before I forget, if somebody can remind me to comment about the hypogloss, so I don't want to confuse you. So if you look at this picture, we have the nucleus ambiguous, the lateral spinothalamic tracts. This one will supply the contralateral because they have decasseted already. We have this spinal trigeminal tracts, the one we, sh we, we saw in the previous picture. So the trigeminal will be involved, the nucleus ambiguous, the 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 tenth cranial nerve especially will be involved, and the um, vestibular nuclei. That's why you see a lot of, you know, you can have nausea, vomiting, and vertigo and all that. Okay, perfect. So guys, this lateral medullary syndrome is very real. You need to know about it. So the question is, which blood supply this area? And that's where we should go next. Anybody who can chat, like, what do, you, what do you think? Which lesion? We have identified the lesion, yes. It's stroke. But you remember stroke is blood supply, is ischemia. Which, which vessel are we talking about? Pica, you guys are amazing. So we, today, if you remember, we talked about the PCA as Alexia with, uh, a gra without agraphia. And now we're going to talk about the pica. So Wallenberg syndrome is what we just talked about. It's occlusion of either majorly actually is the vertebral arteries. The pica is something that examiners like, but vertebral arteries, if you have a, a, a lesion or occlusion of the vertebral arteries, you're gonna get this Wallenberg syndrome. So let me drink something. Okay. So the area is the lateral medulla and you can have its lateral loss of face, pain and temperature with cerebral ataxia. Remember, this will supply part of the cerebellum. So you can have ataxia too. You have weakness of the vocal cords, pharynx and palate and you, you have contralateral loss of pain and temperature. This is a very examinable point. So Basically, this is the other diagram. I, don't, I didn't remember I had this diagram. So the vestibular, you remember the olivary nucleus will be there. The picture is not super clear. And you have the cranial nerves coming out of this. Spinothalamic tract, nucleus and viewers, cranial nerve five, and spinal tract, that's cranial nerve five still. And you can have all this. So even part of the uh, ninth cranial nerve is actually nucleus solitarius is part of it. So the pharynx, the ninth and tenth cranial nerve is part of it. This is a very nice picture. I got it from the internet. And this is the PICA. It's a branch of the vertebral artery. And you see the PICA sends its supply to the, the cerebellum. 
if you remember this picture, you're gonna do very well in the exam, the USMLE exams. So uh, this was just to remind you, you need to know this. I think Dr. Judy, the interventional radiologist, she will do some good work in uh, showing you all these kind of branches. And she, she, had a, she went to do a case today. She had an, uh, an emergency and she will show you a lot of interventional radiology pictures and how they do every good stuff that they do. And with that, you will learn a lot of anatomy. So again, this is another picture showing you ju just that um, this is the vertebra. It comes from all the way down from the neck and this is the PICA. So we talked about the PICA and we have another PCA up here. This is uh, uh, the only branches we talked about today. And I'm not going to talk more about any other branches. Most of you know about MCA where it supplies and the ACA. So this tends to be examinable, very examinable. I think even the AICA, but I chose to talk about the PCA and the PICA for the purposes of this exam. Now, I saw some of you confused um, uh, how the extraocular movement goes. So I'm gonna mention some parts of it. So remember, the rule is SO4, if I'm not wrong, superior rectus is supplied by the trochlea. No, the superior oblique, sorry, SO4. S, O, and four. That's the superior oblique. The lateral rectus, L, R, L, R, six. The lateral rectus is supplied by the sixth cranial nerve. So the rest tends to be supplied by the third cranial nerve. So there are three nerves that supply the extraocular muscles, the, the third, the fourth, and the sixth. And we will see how this goes. So remember, the sixth is on the lateral side, the third is on the medial side and it's also supplying the others. So we want to know how you can move your eye to the left or the right and with all these muscles working as agonists and antagonists to each other. So that's just a reminder of the same thing we just talked about. So in connection to what we just talked about, guys, intranuclear ophthalmoplegia is a very, very examinable uh, concept that you should know. So um, these diagrams, I'm sorry, I mean, they are not as clear as I expected, but if you imagine this is the right eye and this is the left eye, and you have the third cranial nerve, of course, in the middle and the sixth cranial nerve on the lateral side, uh, the connection for you to, whenever this person wants to look to the left, he needs to send some information to this, this muscle and tell this muscle, you know what? You need to look the other side because I'm looking the other side. So, and this connection here is the MLF, okay? So how do you know where, which MLF has a, is affected? Let's see the next diagram. How you identify the medial longitudinal fascicular that is affected. So look, this is the left side. This should be the right. That's for purposes of this presentation. So this is the normal way you look. You're looking straight forward. This is the patient comes to you, is able to look like that. Then you tell them to look to the right. They are able to do that very well, okay? You tell them, okay, fine. Uh, look to the left now. But you see this eye, does not move beyond the middle. It looks like the same as this. So um, if you tell these patients to look to the nasal area, to look to the middle, again, this muscle is able to look to the middle. Look, so I want to start from D. The reason why this patient is able to look to the middle is because the third cranial nerve is functional on both sides, okay? Because looking at the middle, you just need the third cranial nerve because that's, it supplies the middle rectus, okay? But why is it that this patient who was able to look to the right, but when you tell them to look to the left, they are not able, but if you tell them to look nasally, they are able to do that. So what happens in between? 
So for this one to happen, it's C to happen, you need the left lateral rectus to communicate with the, the right medial rectus to move their direction. So that means you have a lesion at the medial longitudinal fasciculus. So in short, how do you know whether it's the right medial longitudinal or the left? So obviously where there is a problem, that's where the lesion is. So if this is the right side, the right medial longitudinal fasciculus has a problem. So uh, this is so much associated with multiple sclerosis because the medial longitudinal fasciculus is highly myelinated. And you remember, um, you, you should remember that for purposes of the exams. There is more to the intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. The superior colliculus tends to be somewhere here and there is something called the PPRF. But when I was doing all these exams, I never saw somebody really wants to pin me down on the PPRF or anything like that. So that's why I didn't want to go there. I want you to go and look through this intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. And if, if you have any question, you can always send me a message. I'm on Facebook. I'm on what um, you can send an email. We can discuss. We can create another kind of short group. But I, I believe Dr. Wanja will all again talk about this. And I think time is up for me. If I am not wrong. Yes, it's exactly 10. And I, I anticipated that this class will take one hour. And I don't want to go more beyond this unless you guys have something to say. I think that should be the end of this presentation, exactly one hour as it was supposed to be. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Fatma. I hope I said it well, Fatma. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila. Awesome. Any questions, guys? Is there anything else we need to talk about right now? I, we, so as I said, we're going to have these sessions like almost one hour and we're gonna limit ourselves to that. Then uh, if I, I know, you know, I'm not an expert in neurology. It's not like I've thought neurology for a long time. If I do a mistake, I, I ask for your forgiveness and always please present it to us and uh, we can go from there. I mean, this is um, Dr. Newsom. I, I think you should talk. I, I was looking forward to talking to you. My, my camera was not able to function and I was late a little bit. And you know, um, I, I'm looking forward to hearing from you and even seeing you. I don't know if we can see you, Dr. News. Are you able to see, uh, to be seen? I just turned talk? my camera on. I'm not okay. sure that I can be seen. I, actually, I'm, Dr. Gichoy is stuck in a case, so I decided to uh, take over her computer here. So it may not be the greatest thing if I break her computer, but okay. I, I, I'm not sure if you can see me either, but I... I yeah. can't see you just yet, but at least I can speak. I'll try clicking more buttons to see if I can, I can see everyone. Oh yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, um, you are an interventional, can you uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. I just know that you are an interventional radiologist. So yep. Yeah, uh, Janice Newsom, I'm the Chief of Interventional Radiology and Image Guided Therapist for Emory University Hospitals and, uh, and Brady Hospital in Atlanta home of the CDC, home of Coca-Cola, home of oh the God. Atlanta Braves, and uh, I guess I should name a few more sports teams, but um, to me, the most important thing, uh, it's also the home of uh, the civil rights movement. Wow, awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. News. I, I think we learn a lot, and we like you to um, kind of, if you have some time in the future, you can teach us some of the information you have. We have a couple of people. Is there anyone here who is interested in radiology, interventional radiology by show of hands? 
Oh, you can chat in the box. Just say yes. I see five participants raise their hands. <laughs> Seven already. Oh my God, you guys are amazing. Yeah, you can just raise your hand. Just want to see that. We have nine. That's 11. Uh, wow. Okay. That's awesome. So well, you see- I Dr. Gichoya to send uh, this group tomorrow. I will be uh, actually giving a lecture for uh, Sapphire and Road to IR. Okay. Um, and uh, I will definitely send uh, that link. But this, this was amazing. amazing. I'm, I'm here to talk about this talk and I'll be trying to join in uh, whenever uh, Dr. Gichoya invites me. Uh, sure. but, uh, but, but this is uh, extremely, extremely important. And I, I learned a lot from your talk. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, I, and as I said, if guys, if there's anything that I say which is not correct, I'm telling you, I don't know everything. I was learning them actually before my presentation. And somebody said they liked the questions. Yeah. If we can get more, I can try and look for more questions and I can post somewhere for you guys. And also, I would like to give many people an opportunity to come and talk to you. And, uh, you know, you need to connect with the people across the world, not only in the U.S., across Dr. News, News. Uh, do I say it right? Newsom? Uh, you got it. Newsom. Newsom. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to mess it up. But Dr. Newsom is one of the, like, we need those people on board. We need to learn from each other. We need to always be there for each other as doctors or people in the healthcare. We are family and we love each other. And we should extend that love to each and every one of you so that in, your, in the process of you preparing for these exams, you can always, always know that somebody somewhere is there for you. So thank you so much, Dr. Newsom. Unless there's something else, uh, you can send it through the chat box, guys. We want to we want to close it there. Anything else, Doctor Newsom? No, I think that uh, th that that should be all. Thanks, everyone, and I'll uh, see you again next time. Okay, thank you. See you next week, Doctor Judy Gishoa will be doing the class for neuroanatomy, and uh, I believe I should be there too as a co-host. Thank you so much, guys. Have a nice week, and thank you. And bye. -bye. bye.